Continuing education credits for physicians and other healthcare professionals is provided by VCU Healthcare Continuing Education. Check out cribsiders.vcuhealth.org for more information. The Cribsiders podcast is for entertainment, education, and informational purposes only. The views and statements expressed on this podcast are solely those of the host. Welcome back to the Cribsiders. Hey! <laughs> Wait, that was just Hello. Weird. That's weird. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Justin Burke. I am joined tonight by Dr. Chris the Chew Man Chew and our wonderful return producer, Dr. Becca Raymond Kolker. Hey, what's up, everybody? <laughs> we are so excited to have you, Becca. We are excited for you and excited to hear about all your successes in residency, but. We should focus today also on our phenomenal guest, Dr. Nicole Johnson, who joined us to discuss juvenile idiopathic arthritis. Uh, But before we go into JIA, Chris, can you tell us about the show? Sure. We are the Pediatric Medicine Podcast. We interview leading experts in the fields to bring you clinical pearls, practice changing knowledge, and answer lingering questions about core topics in pediatric medicine. Tonight, we have a fantastic conversation with our guest, Dr. Johnson. Nicole Johnson, MD, is a pediatric rheumatologist and clinical educator. Her pronouns are she, her. She is a clinical associate professor at an academic institution in Alberta, Canada. She is an advocate for public awareness of pediatric rheumatological diseases. Her clinical and research focus is on the experiences of adolescents with juvenile arthritis as they move to adult healthcare systems. She is also passionate about medical education and diversity, equity, and inclusion in academia. Dr. Johnson teaches us when to consider JIA, how to differentiate subtypes, and what rheumatologists do in their first clinic visit for a JIA patient. All right, we should get into it. What do you think? Hey, Chris, there's so much knowledge in this episode. I hope you have room for all of it. Oh. Womp, womp. <laughs> I have room in your head. In our room, room. We got it. We got it. Great. Dr. Nicole Johnson, we are so excited to have you. Thank you for joining us. Uh, uh, we really appreciate you coming on to the show. Welcome to the Cribsiders. Thank you, and I love the name. We could not have asked for an expert in a in a more troublesome topic in a lot of pediatrics. But before kind of getting into some of the content, um, we'd love to get to know you a little bit better and have our listeners learn more about you. And could you just give us a, a little bit of a, dis, a description of yourself, maybe a one-liner about who you are and some of the things you're interested in? One-liner, okay, I'll try that. Um, I'm a clinical associate professor at an institution outside of the USA. And I have the privilege of having lived in many locations, countries, cultures, and in sometimes different dominant religions. So that's given me a pretty wild perspective on life. That's one of the best one-liners I've heard, to be quite honest. <laughs> Just love working with kids and families. So it gives me inspiration always to be a lifelong learner. Awesome. Absolutely. Is there any book or, you know, it could be a book or I guess a, a journal or a graphic novel that you would um, recommend that every physician should be should read? It could be about medicine or not about medicine. Oh, that's a good one. I The one I'm actually in the middle of is a book, and I think it's applicable to medicine. It's uh, Black Men in a White Coat, A Doctor's Reflection on Race and Medicine by Damien Tweedy. Hope I said his name right. I think you did. He came He came and talked to us at my medical school during my preclinical years, and he's got quite amazing stories to tell. The whole book is pretty incredible. Absolutely. I found it was just a good way for medical students or people in medicine to see some racial inequities and to see from the perspective of being a patient, being a provider in that system, lots of gaps that we can try and help. Awesome. Awesome. So my question that I always ask is, what is your favorite failure and what did you learn from it? Oh, that's a tough one. I have to go way back then. I have to go back to probably pre-medicine. And that was, I was doing a master's degree And I was really sad about not making the honor roll for my master's degree um, after I saw a disappointing result in a particular exam. I was going to let it go. And then I was in the hallway and I got confronted by one of the professors for that course. And he actually asked me, did you graduate? And I thought, whoa. 
I was shocked, right? So how could you ask me, did I graduate? Or, you know, the fact that he thought I didn't even deserve the grade that I got, which is still decent. It just wasn't what I was aiming for. So my spider senses went off and I said, how could he think that I was not worthy of an excellent grade, much more graduation? So I went to pursue that and looked at how my grades came to this course. And the second professor who was responsible for the course was the one I went to. And he said, I'm, I, I know you'll be disappointed with that grade, Nicole. And I thought, oh, okay, this is getting more interesting. So when I investigated the, the grades, I saw that my mistakes were probably not worthy of such a poor result. And he knew I understood that. So I said, well, what happened? And what we found out was that the only portion of the course that was marked by the first professor was the only part that I didn't excel in. And he said, so the second professor says to me, you know, he was always out to get you as you're the only student that challenged him and spoke up in a seminar series. Now, mind you, wow. we were told from the beginning, it's a seminar series, so you'll get grades based on participation. So I participated accordingly. Little did I know that was putting a target on my back. And at the end of the day, the second professor said, you have a grounds to appeal. Would you do it? And I asked him, would you help me? And his answer was, well, everyone's afraid of him. And I thought, okay, I'm going to walk away from this one. There's only so much time and energy one can invest in fighting systems at that time. And I thought, I have bigger things to do. I have to move on. I have medicine. I have graduated. So his mission was not achieved. And for me, the most important message was that you will find obstacles. There'll be people that come after you because they feel threatened by you. Or in my case, it was also about my color of my skin. And I realized that I was still going to succeed no matter what, just jump over the obstacles. So I became a lifelong learner. I jump over obstacles. I remove obstacles. And I fight for those below me. And that's why I think I did education. I love that answer. That was amazing. I appreciate you sharing that. Can, can I ask, how do you f decide how and when to pit the battles? Because I imagine that just wears you down time after time. And at certain points, it's something like, no, I'm taking a stand. And other times, it sounds like in this one where it's like, this isn't worth my time. Is, is there, a, can you talk yeah. through that? Because I think a lot of our listeners probably, probably what deal it, with some of these issues as well. Yeah, I can see that. I think... Part of it was I'd already fought racism in high school. I went to an international school and I had a particular principal at the time who felt a black student should not get A's, black students should not succeed. And I had a, a block on teachers writing references for me to get into medical school, sorry, to get into an undergraduate. So I'd already fought a major battle at a very young age. So I was cruising through undergrad and master's, just excited to be there, excited to learn and having overcome such a big obstacle and such a huge power differential. So in this case, I thought, oh, I could fight it. But I had a professor who looked at me and was afraid of his own peer. So that was my first telling point that this is going to be a long emotional mm -hmm. battle. And I yeah. thought, is it worth it when I'm actually going to be in a position where I can help others? And because at this point I had been accepted into the medical school. So I thought I'd rather put energy into that where I could be helping other people. So I think there were too many obstacles at the time. I think if I was staying in the program, yes. I think if I hadn't have received the degree based on that one particular course, I would have fought it. Thank you for sharing that. Um, one of the, you know, you shared, shared a book. And so sometimes we also do what we call the pitch of the week and share other pieces of media or things that we're into. And back to tell me, do, do you have something to, to share for this, uh, this episode's pitch of the week? Um, yeah, I, I had a few very different uh, things to share, but I'll, I'll just pick one, um, which is something you can't buy and it's friends. Um, and I think Pick of the week this week is friends because, you know, I, I think I mentioned earlier before I started recording, I'm starting intern year tomorrow, um, which is super exciting, but it's also really um, scary and appropriately, you know, anxiety inducing because it's, it's such a big responsibility to take on and so much to learn. Um, and so I, I've been feeling super grateful all week that I have such amazing friends um, from medical school that are also starting, you know, intern year, whether it's tomorrow or, you know, July 1, um, that we're all kind of in different ways going through this together and can kind of like 
bounce off each other of like, oh, like what kind of onboarding did you have to do or, or how bad was your first day or, or whatever it is and and just sort of have that camaraderie and, and to be able to support each other. So I'm, I'm really feeling that and trying to, to lean into the like feeling of gratitude as a sort of a balm against uh, all, the, all the stress and, and sort of fear that I think is pretty natural in this phase. Chris, how about you? Do you have anything to for Pitch of the Week? Well, initially I was going to just say um, I've been enjoying the Loki series uh, on uh, on Disney Plus, but uh, I think my pick of the week is going to be I because I just went to all of them as the graduating class of the Med, the MedPeds graduating class of 2021. Um, they were just like a, a fantastic here at Ohio State University where I'm uh, where I'm at. Um, I just want to give them a, a great shout out because they were just a wonderful group. I also I'd give a shout out to the internal medicine class, but they're probably not listening to this podcast, but. I know our med peds will be. <laughs> They'll never know. <laughs> I did have uh, one that I wanted to share. It's a new show that just came out on PBS. It's a mini series documentary called Philly DA that is about Larry Krasner, a the Philadelphia district attorney who had a lifelong career as a public defender and then ran and is now the district attorney in Philadelphia. It's uh, one of the few very progressive uh, district attorneys and is really kind of reshaping some of the criminal legal system there and serving as a model in other places in the US. And the documentary is phenomenal. They have extremely close access to him and some of the administrative meetings and the pushback that he received, criticism from both sides of people thinking he's not progressive enough and others in opposition. It's very well done. PBS miniseries documentary. I haven't recommended too many of those, but it's it's worth checking out. It's very well done. All right, team. We're 10 minutes in and it is time to dive into some content. So so let's get some learning done. And Becca, uh, you wanna start us off with our first big case? Yeah, so we're, we're going international here um, to Cashlack Children's International. Um, and we have Olivia, uh, also goes by Ollie. Ollie Go Articular is a previously healthy four-year-old with almost two months of right knee pain presenting to um, uh, her primary care pediatrician. Um, so just to start really general for us general pediatricians in the audience, how should a primary care pediatrician evaluate this kid? Like we always say in medicine, the first thing is the history. So we have the location being the knee, but I would also make sure that it's exactly over the joint or is it around the joint? So is it above, below, behind, in the front of the knee? This is really important because it helps you decide, is it joint or is it soft tissue? And then are there any other locations? Because sometimes the kids might focus on the one that hurts the most, but there might be others that you didn't think about. I would ask about the timing. So is it in the morning that there's a complaint or is it during the day or is it with activity? I would ask about the duration of symptoms. Is it in this business of, is it almost two weeks or was there an episode before? Is it shorter than two, two months? Um, those kind of things help you sort things out. We'd want to know that over this two month, is it something that's getting worse over time, coming and going, or getting better with time? I would be looking for things that make it worse. So is it when she jumps or walks or crawls? Is it trying to bend the knee, putting on clothes? One of my coolest stories was a mom who said, I just never used a onesie with this child because they can't bend their knees and the hip, right? Um, I would look to see, are there any associated symptoms with it? Is there a fever? Is there a weight loss? Is there a loss of appetite? Is there a lot of fatigue? When you do your review of systems, you're looking for other organs that are in trouble. Are they mouth ulcers? Are they troubles with vision? Is there belly pain? Is there diarrhea? Is there rash? Because you're trying to say, is it going to be down my lovely diagnosis of exclusion, juvenile idiopathic arthritis, or is it going to be something that's associated with arthritis? And what I think in the first stages is important to do is to look at the impact on life. So is it stopping this kid from being who they are? Is it changing their personality where they're withdrawn, not playing with their friends or getting tired very easily? Has it changed the whole family dynamic? So that mom that I told you about says, I never put a onesie. There might be situations where the family says, we never plan long hikes in the morning. It has to be in the middle of the day. Or we plan a hike, but we have to stop because she just seems to tire more than any other four-year-old. 
clearly a family history can be helpful to you. So if there are distant relatives like grandparents or first cousins, I tend to go between one to two degree relatives about do they have any autoimmune diseases or any other arthritis. And no matter how old the child is, this is where I get into this inclusive business is ask the kid (laughs) what they know and how it impacts them because they have valuable information for you just as how parents have valuable information and siblings, because I think they have a wealth of knowledge to help you understand what's really happening. You know, moving from the history, always a physical exam. So people are very timid to do a musculoskeletal exam on a child, but it's actually pretty cool. You just tell them it's like gym class, you know, you're stretching and moving things by doing that. But also observation, watch how they walk into the room, see how they sit. Uh, either in the chair or on your examination bed. And then you want to do a general exam because we're always looking for associated symptoms. So you do a good ear, nose, and throat, a good rest cardio examination. You want to look at the nails. You want to look at skin because those will be clues that might not be part of the history, but you might see on the physical exam. Tricks for young kids, look for symmetry. Use their body as your tool. So is the, the fingers on one side look the same as the other? Does the knee look the same as the other side? and look for signs of chronicity. So that would be a leg length difference or an asymmetric jaw or a very swollen finger or a digit. And lastly, investigations, because you want to rule out comorbidities or mimickers. Hopefully that's helpful. So you've given us like a lot of different symptoms and history that you're gathering. Are there like big red flag things that, you know, me as a, not, as a, a very simple pediatrician, I should not miss? Ooh. <laughs> I think you should not miss if it's affecting function. So if that that child is given up a sport or not able to keep up with their peer, I think that's something that warrants that attention. Um, when you see a child with one leg longer than the other, you have to ask yourself, is there something happening at the hip, the knee, or the ankle? And maybe kind of building off of that and not just missing red flag symptoms, but in a, a child with knee pain, clearly there's a broad differential and not throwing shade at rheumatology, but that's pretty low on the list, right? You know, there's a lot of reasons a kid can can limp. And so are there certain things, whether it's age group, whether it's physical exam findings, whether it's chronicity, that really start moving the autoimmune diseases up a little bit higher? Are there certain times when you're thinking, you know, I'm not just saying this to sound good on rounds and say it could be JIA, but you know, actually, based on XYZ, I really think we should take this seriously. You raise a good point, because I think I missed it in earlier in the conversation about what things you don't want to miss that could be dangerous, because you might think it's JIA and it's not. So I think people need to think about the concept that it's an arthritis is really inflammation that is unwarranted. So it's not So we still think, is it an infection? Is it a malignancy? Is there some other reason the immune system's turned on? So that's number one. So you want to do the life-threatening thing. So you can be malignancy, and sometimes you think in terms of hematological malignancies. Sometimes it could be a malignancy of the local area, right? A cartilage problem or muscle malignancy or a bone malignancy. When you get down to saying, okay, I've excluded a lot of other things. It's not associated with another illness like inflammatory bowel disease or celiac or thyroid. Then you're saying, if it's JIA, what are the things that make you think JIA? I think JIA when it's sort of sometimes an an insidious onset. So the kid has just been adapting to the problem. So it's clearly not acute. So they've made adaptations in their life. I think of JIA when there's morning symptoms and then the middle of the day might be great. But after using the joint at the end of the day, they might be in trouble again. I think of JIA when... um, there's a family history of something autoimmune. It doesn't have to be JIA, but it could be something like in this family, they have psoriasis or in this family, they may be somebody with thyroid disease. So it gives you that autoimmune flavor. Definitely when you start to see that there's a deformity, you start to think that this problem has been longer than you than they probably reported in terms of pain. What a lot of people get tripped up on is thinking that every kid with JIA must complain of pain. The majority don't. They may complain of pain at a specific time or specific activity when that joint is used. But as an overall question, do you have joint pain? Many of them will tell you, no, it's just weird, or it doesn't move right, or when I do this, it bothers me. 
So I think we ask very specific pointed questions about when you're using the joint, what happens, because that's when you'll hear about the pain. To follow up your wonderful description of some of those JIA indicators, what are some of the things that kids present with, if not pain? And is it usually typical for them to present later on in a course after chronicity? Because um, my thought is that a kid with two days of knee pain, unlikely JIA, but I admit, I don't know sometimes when they are caught in clinic or an inpatient. Are there specific illness strips where this is um, how they typically present and at what stage of the illness progression they present? Ooh, that's a hard question um, because there's so many different types of JIA. So they present with different associated symptoms. They might affect different joints, some which you use on a regular basis and some you don't use. So for example, um, if it is a finger on your non-dominant hand, it might take longer for that child to come to you. However, if it's the wrist on the dominant hand, they're going to be in, you know, in early because it's their everyday writing or if they're in school age. Um, if they're a toddler, it might be harder because they might not know any different. So to them, it's always a painful joint to them, right? We do have situations because people are not comfortable with the musculoskeletal exam that kids might present a lot later with some signs of the chronicity, which is sad to say in our day and age, right, that we can have kids that come in with a deformity, but it, it does occur because the children, again, are not reporters of pain. They might be reporters of poor function of a joint. And some children may not understand it as something to bring to their parents because it's intermittent sometimes. So if the pain was very persistent all day long, such as when you hit it or break it, it's not going anywhere, right? That pain is just present all the time. Whereas in the situation of JIA, it might be more painful when there is a triggering or aggravating event and then it settles down. So kids think, I won't bring it to mom's attention or dad's attention because it does go away temporarily. Um, I think morning symptoms helps. So asking about that stiffness or gelling phenomena we have, that if you stay too still, then it's hard to move it after. That's a very helpful one. I think clearly swelling in a joint is a helpful one and pain with activity is a helpful one. That's really helpful. So we've, we've talked about like, you know, some of these possible illness scripts that we might see coming in are more common things. So can, do you mind discussing with us exactly what is, what does JIA stand for? And I, at one point, I, I believe, I think I was in med school, we used to call it JRA too. So do we yeah. have exact definitions and did the terms change on us or what, you know, what's going on here? Yes, the terms did change because it's all about where the literature came from. So a back, you know, sort of a backstory behind that. So JRA was juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. It was mostly used in North America and people used to confuse that with only rheumatoid arthritis. So they thought, well, that's not encompassing all of what children experience. So that was one of the push behind a change in name. Um, there was also JCA, which is ju juvenile chronic arthritis, more used in UK and Europe. And then finally, they realized we all need to talk the same language. So there was an international collaboration that came up with JIA. So it's juvenile idiopathic arthritis trying to highlight that it occurs in young people. And idiopathic, it's not because it's associated with another underlying autoimmune disease. So it's, it's a diagnosis of exclusion in that sense. Do we have like, what, what exactly is the definition of JIA then? Correct. So the JIA is a diagnosis of exclusion that typically has an onset in symptoms in a child that's less than 16 years of age. Usually they want their joint symptoms to be persistent beyond six weeks and that you've excluded other underlying conditions such as infection or malignancies. People always ask why six weeks and I think part of that is you wanna catch it early enough that you're not into chronic changes, but you also want to respect the fact that a post-infectious arthritis could last close to that time. So you're trying to not capture those who are reacting to an inf infectious arthritis. And so is it that simple if you have multiple arthritis without a clear other source, it doesn't matter what your rheumatoid factor is yet. It doesn't matter what your ESR is or what imaging shows. If you have truly ruled out other cases and you have polyarthritis, it is JIA. Correct. So JIA is a clinical diagnosis. So this, the diagnostic test won't be the answer, which is why I emphasize so much the history and the physical. 
because that is the clinical diagnosis. And then where your tests come into play is helping you rule in or rule out other diseases, but it also helps you figuring out what is the likelihood of the subtype of childhood arthritis that you have, because there's seven different subtypes that we try to categorize our patients in. So if you don't know what it is, it's either JIA or you haven't thought enough about the other things. <laughs> Sadly. <laughs> That's, that's what it is. So, and, so for oh, oh, I, oh, before we go away from that, I wanted to highlight one thing. So you can have JIA with only one joint. So it's not because oh, it's one or more, right? Only a no polyarthritis. More. Yeah. Right. Right. So even one joint could be significant for that one for that child. Justin, you look like your mind has been blown open. <laughs> I've never seen one joint JIA, and this is fascinating. And now, I, I. Yeah, this is going to always confuse me now when someone comes in with one joint pain and I'm not sure what it is. I, it's going to move it higher on the list. There yeah. you go. One joint. I always tell the students one joint changes your whole differential. Yeah, true. Wow. So say for Ollie, um, you know, Ollie's primary care pediatrician did a really thorough workup and ruled out any infections, both acute and indolent, and also ruled out malignancy giving Ollie this diagnosis of juvenile idiopathic arthritis, JIA. So you already mentioned that there are seven subtypes of JIA. And clinically, how do you think about these subtypes? You know, do you have a schema that you kind of rely on when you're seeing a patient in clinic? Yes, to, to sort of figure out which of the seven subtypes, I think about how many joints is it, one, you know, is it the one or is it more than five? I look at the distribution of the joint. Is it a large joint or a small joint? Which location, for example, on the hand, a, a joint, a, what we call the DIP, the distal interphalangeal one, would be different in my thought process if it's the middle one or the MCP. So, so all of that helps me with thinking about my problem. I look at the age of the child when the symptoms are arriving. I Certainly, we do do blood work to sort of help with the criteria. So is it a rheumatoid factor, positive or negative? Maybe you might want to do genetic testing of an, what we call the HLA-B27, which has a very specific sort of cluster of symptoms that comes with it. On the physical exam, you might be looking for, are there any digital changes or nail changes that might put you in the thought process of psoriasis uh, or psoriatic arthritis? And we have others that have systemic symptoms. So if there's fever or rash, you might be thinking of a different subtype, sort of the, the systemic JIA. So I use a little bit of the presentation in terms of how long it's been, which joint it is, small or large, is it symmetric or not symmetric? What's the age of the child? Is there a family history? Do they have other things on their physical exam or other things in their blood work to help me categorize them? And can you go through each of the classification categories and maybe a little bit about what are some of the hallmark symptoms or history findings that are associated with that classification? So if we started with an oligo meaning few, so it's usually in the first six months of the illness, the child has less than five presenting joints. Typically, they like to be larger joints. The most common is probably the knee, followed by maybe ankle, wrist, and elbow. Usually, the age group, they tend to be the young children. So the toddlers, I always think of the toddler, even before daycare or early preschool kind of, that gives you a hint. Sometimes they get easily missed with the psoriatic arthritis because they may also present with just a few joints and large joints. However, to make the psoriatic category, you think in terms of they already have psoriasis rash. And if they don't have that with their arthritis, it could be needing two of the following. So nail changes, such as what we call nail pits, they look like indents in the nail. Um, they may have thickened nail, which we call lovely name onchalysis. Or they may have a, what we call a sausage digit or dactylitis. So it's a very widened joint that expands past the joint line. And or they have a family history of someone of first degree with psoriasis or psoriatic arthritis. Other categories, you can have maybe few joints, but it could also be a lot. It would be the emphasitis related juvenile idiopathic arthritis. People talk about it being a boy older than six. However, I've seen it in girls. Some of their presentation tends to be the lower limbs first. So they might complain of heel pain. They might complain of the ankles, the midfoot, but they can have 
lower back pain, such as inflammatory back pain, or have involvement of the sacroiliac joint. And they tend to have that much earlier than they have the adult version of this, which is alkalosing spondylitis, where they have a fusion of the back. So the young kids won't have necessarily the back symptoms early. It may be the other things that I spoke of. And they may have a family history of of what we call HLA-B27 gene-associated diseases. That could be a very painful inflammation in the eye or iritis or uveitis. It could be their parent has sacroiliitis. Their parent could have alkalosing spondylitis or inflammatory bowel disease. So that tends to be that cluster of story behind the child presenting with that. Polyarthritis is another good one. I think people immediately think of rheumatoid arthritis in a child, but we try to have them think of it a little differently in saying that it's five or more joints, can be large, can be small. And whether you have a rheumatoid factor present or not would help you decide between those two categories. Very symmetric in some. Sometimes they can present with a fever, but that's not part of the diagnostic criteria for them. But the one never to forget that does come with fever is your systemic onset juvenile idiopathic arthritis. So they may have the fever, their arthritis. They tend to have a very characteristic rash as well that can be um, quite erythematous, but it comes and goes and it leaves no mark when it's gone. And that's always fascinating as the, the intern on who says, oh, there was no rash and your attending comes and goes, well, there it is. Well, yeah, because it comes and goes. <laughs> tends to come and go sometimes around the time of the fever. But what we have to think about with that, if you can't find the rash, you also want to look for other things. So they can have generalized lymphadenopathy. They can have hepatosplenomegaly. They can have uh, serositis, which is inflammation around the heart or lungs or the abdomen. And they can have life-threatening complications. So you want to find them early. And they may be your sick child that's in the ICU with a fever of unknown origin. So by taking time with the history and the physical and labs, you might figure that out. And lastly, there's other. They don't fit into a category or they fit into more than one. So my question is, what is the main reason why we're trying to do these subtypes? Is it because of the complications or is it because of treatment or a combination of the two? Um, Like, uh, how how does it help us to be able to do these different subtypes? That's a really good point. And there's always going to be debate about have we found the right way to group them? So there will always be controversy in the literature about what we're using as our criteria, especially because at this point it is clinical. There are lots of research studies trying to classify that so we can do more personalized medicine. But I think you raised a good point. You raised a point about if you know the subtype, does it help you? I think for me it does. I think it helps me think about the things that they might be a risk for. So for example, if you are an oligo JIA, I'm worried that you're not going to know that you have uveitis or inflammation of the eye. So that helps me say to the parent, your child might not complain, so you have to keep up with your eye appointments. Whereas if I'm dealing with an enthesitis related juvenile idiopathic arthritis, they don't need to be screened as frequently because typically when they get their inflammation, they feel the symptoms. So I would be telling the family about if you see a red eye or a painful eye or an eye that keeps tearing or an eye that's very sensitive to light, or a loss of vision that comes on quickly, that is a medical emergency. So there's a different way in which you counsel the patients, but there's also a way in which you may tailor the treatment depending on their subtype. So some are more aggressive to damage the joint more quickly, such as a rheumatoid factor positive poly JIA, but also the systemics, for example, it would dictate, it could be life-threatening, so you have to act quickly. So the subtypes help us with treatment but also also our education and guidance to the families. And it sounds like the rheumatoid factor is one that can help almost risk stratify the severity of the polyarthritis. Is there any other lab work in playing a role in classifying these individuals? I, I can't help but think autoimmune, we need to be checking inflammatory markers and ANA, rheumatoid factor, anti-CCP, Do any of these labs play a role in the stratification or subclassification, or are we true rheumatologists now, and it's all about history and physical? I'm going to still stick with my history and physical. The reason behind that is rheumatoid factor is still less than 10% of our total population of children with a chronic GIA. So if people rely on the test alone, they're going to miss a lot of children that need our help. Not to say that we don't value them when they do come but it's not going to make the decision to send to a rheumatologist or not in most scenarios. And then how about as ruling out causes of inflammatory conditions? Let's say we're not entirely sure what this is. 
and the CRP and ESR are low while they're having this pain or discomfort. Can we say that this is not an autoimmune inflammatory disorder or no, no, no. we can't. We can't <laughs> because I have seen children present with like 15 joints with perfect blood work. Wow. wow. But, but yet they're not participating in gym because it hurts. They're going to school, but they're not participating in gym or they've given up their elite athlete status, for example, because they're not keeping up to the bar. Right. So I think the tests are helpful in turning, figuring out things such as do you have an intercurrent illness that's coming along with this? It's helpful. Is this a malignancy? Um, it's helpful to look for celiac disease or thyroid disease that's coming along with it. It's helpful to point you towards other rheumatological diseases because you can present with arthritis and have juvenile dermatomyositis. You could have lupus. Um, you could have inflammatory bowel disease. And you're helping the other specialists come to the table. Um, so that's where the labs are critical. We do use our ANA to determine your risk of uveitis. So that might dictate your screening. But again, I'm kind of sorry, but happy to say that it's really the astuteness and the curiosity of the clinician that will help you. It's a humbling field. <laughs> Very. <laughs> and lots of unknowns. We live in a world of unknowns. Hopefully, with research and technology, we will get better at being able to dictate the subtype, dictate the prognosis, be able to do personalized medicine. Um, you know, so I have a few thoughts on that. And you mentioned this a little bit earlier when you're talking about some of the complications that we might need to be screening for depending on the subtype of JIA. Can you talk a little bit about some of the common complications of JIA and also maybe a little bit about some rare ones that we really shouldn't miss? Okay. So some of the common ones, of course, would be anything that's related to the joint or the tissues surrounding that. So the whole goal of figuring it out early is to prevent any joint damage. And that joint damage could lead to cartilage loss or secondary osteoarthritis because there's no, um, the integrity of the joint has been lost if it's not treated well. And you can have, because we're dealing with children who are still growing, if you don't handle the inflammation, the joint, you'll get either asymmetric growth or poor growth of that region, which could be emotionally taxing because of the pain. It could be physically deforming, so therefore loss of confidence, and it can change what they decide they want to do for their life, right? Um, so looking at the deformity of the joint is an important piece. Uveitis or the inflammation of the eye is a common presentation across the subtypes. Some get it more often than others. Some get it without symptoms, so it needs to be picked up by an eye doctor, and others get it. It's symptomatic and painful that it needs attention. Previously, without some of our better medications and regimes, we used to actually have patients that went blind. So when I started my career, I had patients who uh, had JIA and had blindness from the inflammation. Happy to say that our treatments are better, so we're less likely to see that, but you need to pick it up and screen for it. Some of the growth things that we don't think about is, for example, the jaw. We used to have this concept that it's only the children with multiple poly JIA rheumatoid factor that will have jaw involvement. So the temporomandibular joint, and I've learned anyone can look for it <laughs> and try to find it as early as you can. But it's a hard one to pick up before there is actual changes. But I do tell families to screen for that. If they have pain with chewing or asymmetry of the face or asymmetry of jaw opening, that's a good one to pick up as early as you can. And you asked about life-threatening. So for sure, um, our systemic juvenile idiopathic arthritis, we do worry about them because life-threatening could be the cirrusitis. So the swelling around the heart and lungs can be compromising. But more importantly, they can run into an autoimmune cytokine storm, which we know as MAS in rheumatology, macrophage activating syndrome. And we can you know, have destruction of the cells from the bone marrow so they can lose function and organ damage and death. So you have to pick that up with your story of fever um, and uh, organ dysfunction and blood work. I've never heard MAS described as autoimmune storm, and I think that that is a very articulate way to describe it. I do have a question in differentiating some of these systemic complications of systemic JIA and something like lupus with joint involvement. Is there a clear way to go down one path or is systemic JIA basically something very similar, but not meeting enough lupus criteria? Or I imagine those are on the differential together a lot. Is they there... are. 
clear way to separate them in in my um, mind and for Chris. Yeah, I think I think the the systemic feature lends itself to really thinking what else could it be and you got to do that work early. So you at the same time you're probably it's probably going to be a healthy child who walked in off the street suddenly sick, right? So you're going to be there with your infectious disease colleagues to try and figure out is there any infections that we miss whether bacterial or viral or parasitic or whatever. Um, you're going to be at the table with your hematolo uh, he hematologist and oncology specialist to say are we missing a cancer? Then you get down to, well, it's none of those. It's not inflammatory bowel disease either. So the lupus side of things or the vasculitis, it might be in terms of what organs are involved, how they present. Are you able to do a biopsy of any of these organs? Like look at the kidney in lupus. That's very helpful in most cases. Um, the blood work in lupus, you would be looking at what's happened with the, that ANA that we talked about in JA is not as critical for diagnosis, but for lupus is extremely critical. And then which proteins are we binding to in the nucleus might tell you that we're really dealing with lupus and antibodies might tell you that you're dealing with a vasculitis. So there, we look at the organs, how they're presenting associated symptoms might send you down the lupus tree instead. Thank you. That's helpful. So I, I know we're we're want to we're, we're getting uh, shorter on time, and I know we want to talk a little bit more on uh, treatment options. One thing I, I do want to touch on really quick. So I, I know we've 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 harped on multiple times now about making sure they get their screening eye exams and so forth. Like as a pediatrician, and I'm seeing a patient who is now known GIA, you know, whatever subtype, you know, what are the things that I need to be making sure happens for this kid, you know? Yes, maybe they're seeing the rheumatologist too. What do I need to be looking for? Are there special considerations I need to do, like vaccinations, things like that? Mm -hmm. Like, is there anything I need to be doing as a pediatrician? So as a pediatrician, you, I think what we, we appreciate is being at the other end of the, that call when we're dealing with intercurrent illnesses, because of course our children are immunosuppressed. So being able to quickly delineate this is a flare of the disease versus you actually have a strep streptococcal infection that needs to be treated, or you have an ear infection that needs to be treated. That's very helpful because once that's treated and things settle down, it's, you know, the ch child feels better. Or um, by treating those intercurrent illnesses, we're less likely to put them in a flare as well. And from a rheumatologist and general pediatrician point of view, the chronicity is the key. So is that child emotionally growing? Is that child coping? Have we addressed some of the hardships of having a chronic illness? So I think that's where that collaborative effort is very helpful. Is the family doing well? Because sometimes the responsibility on the parents is, is, is telling and also on the siblings to watch their, their siblings suffer. Moving on to this, this broad category of treatment, just starting really basic, what is the first line treatment for patients with JIA? And also, you know, I was a little confused in doing my reading, you know, should we be doing step up treatment as needed, like how we think about asthma, or should we really start aggressive and then back off once symptoms kind of are more reprieved? What's what's the approach? I would say the approach is really be aggressive at the beginning, because you want to prevent damage, you want to prevent that child having a permanent sequelae from their illness. So for sure, while you're working them up, people turn to anti inflammatories to support them with their pain. But within short order, you want to get to a disease modifying medication. So those will be our immunosuppressive medications. We now have at our disposal in some societies and healthcare systems biologics, which are immune specific targets. So rather than using steroids such as prednisone for long periods of time, we're now fortunate to have disease modifying medications that can help. And if we were to identify someone that we felt confident had. JIA, and we even identify that this is rheumatoid factor polyarthritis or, or systemic JIA, felt comfortable and referred them to a rheumatologist, either inpatient or outpatient. W what's that first clinic visit looking like? What is the first line treatment that you're considering? What's mm -hmm. the thought process? Is it just methotrexate? Is it, well, what's going on? And what, what are you guys yeah. doing behind the scenes once we push them off yes. to you? Then we, we talk about the disease modified medications very early. So we talk to them about methotrexate um, and the fact that they're on medications for years that are potentially immunosuppressive, not to say that they will be you know, inundated with infections, but we try to educate the families about 
the pros and cons of these medications. We do use steroids, but very sparingly and very uh, short term if we can. In, for example, to to get our disease modifying medications to work because they have a very slow onset. If it's a localized joint. Uh, we might choose a joint injection, which we inject steroids into that joint. So for example, your little Ollie, the four-year-old with the big knee, you might inject that knee, one, to give relief, two, to get function back very quickly. But if it doesn't last, you still want to use your methotrexate. Some countries don't have access to a lot of these biologics, so they would, for example, use methotrexate in combination with others. Um, like lufthidamide or um, sulfasalazine, they might come into play in in a resource poor environment because biologics are costly. And does the subtype of JIA impact which treatment option that you might go with first, or um, does it not really have? Is it more just about kind of thinking about other complications and and things that you would be concerned about? Yeah. So I would say that across the board, most of the subcategories, methotrexate is the is the number one option. I think you add a biologic very quickly if they're doing poorly across the subtypes. There may be insurance restrictions or access to biologic restrictions that might make it more challenging to do that work because that's managed regionally and by insurance very differently. I think the message is we no longer rely on prednisone or steroids long-term systemically. For sure, if it's life-threatening, we have to use high-dose steroids, but we're trying to find whatever we can use that's steroid sparing. And I think we don't rely on just repeatedly injecting the same joint over and over and not looking at the big picture of controlling the disease. We want them to be disease-free in terms of symptoms, function of the joint with meds, And if we're fortunate enough, they get to that point and stay in remission off medications at some point later in life. And to follow up on that, when you're monitoring these patients, what does monitoring of methotrexate look like? And are you up titrating, down titrating dose, or just determining whether to start on steroids? Are there some people that don't need methotrexate? And how do you how do you yeah. do all this? Oh, loaded question, but I'll try. You know, what <laughs> so is rheumatology method- fellowship? <laughs> so, so methotrexate, we do monitor. We do do blood work periodically throughout the year um, to look for any decrease in cells that fight infections. We look for any liver dysfunction. We do also check in with the patients because not just about blood work, which although you might see some variations in the liver tests, it's never, it's not often that one has to take them off because of the side effect on the liver. More often, actually, I see in my monitoring that the liver goes up with an infection, it comes right back down and everybody's happy. But of course, if there's a trouble with their liver function, you would have to change your treatment. So methotrexate is notorious for causing nausea, and it's also pre-anticipatory nausea in some children or post-dose nausea. So we have to sort of monitor those side effects, provide additional medications for nausea. And if we certainly can help with psychological counseling. And if that fails, you do have to change the medication because quality of life does matter. Now, is methotrexate the one that you have to give with folic acid? Yes. Yes. And Why is that? So we're hoping to diminish the side effects. Some of that could be mouth ulcers. Some of that could be the impact on the liver and nausea. So I do monitor, I do monitor how they're managing with their methotrexate, whether it's oral or subcutaneously. I also monitor how they're doing with their folic acid and up or change the dose. Sometimes they need on Dancitron. And are there any non-pharmacological treatments for JIA? Oh, you're speaking to the the converted. (laughs) I love multidisciplinary care, and that's the beauty of being in rheumatology. We have so much help from our allied health colleagues, our nursing staff with the education and support. We have the occupational therapists and physiotherapists to look at function of the joint and strengthening and protection and also guiding children because we have patients who are athletes, right? And they're star athletes. We need to maintain that level of, of activity and just general health. If we don't move the joints, they won't do well. In some places that are fortunate enough to have a dietitian or a pharmacist, we can help the families navigate this complex polypharmacy that they do. My dream would also be to have a vocational counselor because I, I, I want the kids to believe they have a future. I want them to, to be who they were going to be irrespective of their chronic illness. Some centers have what they call a navigation coordinator or somebody to help them with transition into adult medicine. That's another really aspirational thing that I think we should think about. 
and self-management tools so the kids learn how to deal with their chronic illness themselves. Now, are a lot of these kids, is it automatic referral to OTPT or is, or do you, is it selective? Um, it would be lovely if everybody had access. <laughs> um, but at the same time, we know how busy having a chronic illness is. So certainly we have to take into account the amount of missed work time for the parents, the amount of school missed time for the children. So if it's a need and I, we see that as a need, for sure, we refer them. Sometimes they don't need them for very long. So some of the kids doing very well, they just need focused attention to specific joints and it lasts for this much time. And then they don't need that support anymore. They continue on their own with their self-management. And there are other times in the middle of a flare where they were doing great and here was a joint that's not working, they might need to go back again. So it comes and goes. And I think, I think the important message is you may need multiple people to provide support to have the best outcomes. That's super, super helpful perspective. When we first met Nicole, we were talking a lot about kind of how the Cribsiders is really trying to be thoughtful around um, how we present and talk about racial disparities and racial differences in medicine. And, you know, we often talk on this show about how race is a poor genetic marker for um, biological illness, even though it's used um, quite a bit in medicine and it's also used a lot in autoimmune disease, um, you know, talking about certain diseases that are associated with various races. In your clinical practice, how do you kind of reconcile this um, and, you know, be mindful of not perpetuating disparities? Um, I think for me, the, well, one thing is to let people know that JA crosses every race, ethnicity, and genetics. I think that's, that's a powerful one. Um, Mm -hmm. I think as a clinician, my approach to this situation is always to be thoughtful, to be thoughtful about their rather than spending a lot of time and saying what ethnicity they are, is asking what is their life experience. So to me, I'm thoughtful about, as you said, can they go to an OT and physio appointment? Can they come into my clinic as often as they need to? And if they can't, can I find a resource that's more convenient to them so that everybody has the hopefully is equitable access to the things that will make them have a better outcome? And if they aren't able to follow through, then actually dive into, well, why can't you follow through? What are the things we can support you with? Rather than assuming that they did that deliberately because they didn't think it was important, it may be they just can't get to it. It may be that that's too much of a family tax for them to be able to do. For example, I found out a situation where a family was on a biologic. I thought we had perfect 100% coverage for this medication financially, and then the medication was stopped. And if you asked, well, did you just not want to do it? And this fact that they actually lost their coverage in that time and were too, I guess, humble or embarrassed to bring that up. So if you make it normal or acceptable for these conversations to be part of what you do and you set that stage, then they feel safe to tell you that. And then you can find, is there another way you can get access to it? So I think my concept is no matter the social economic background that you come from, we will support you. And I think that's a key message that you give, you know, in the clinic. And looking at the person holistically will always be of benefit to help you with those health inequities. Beautiful. Awesome. This has been extremely helpful, I think, for our listeners. Are there core takeaway points or take-home points that you think it's important for listeners to to leave this episode with? Okay, I'll try to get four. (laughs) I have four, (laughs) but I hope they're they're important four. Um, One would be children get arthritis too. I, the amount of times that the children are shy to tell about their symptoms because they think it's an old people's disease, what they call it. So, and families doubt themselves because the child is young, they might think it and then they dismiss it and then it goes on for a while. Um, so that's my first important message. Children get arthritis too. Uh, second would be when children have a, sw- a swollen joint or they have trouble using a joint or pain in a joint, it's important to assess for arthritis and not to dismiss it as only an injury possibly. And if it goes on for longer, then it's clearly not only an infection if it's going on for a long time. Thirdly, there are many types of arthritis. So that way you have to look at the different characteristics of the symptoms, what's associated with, what they look like on exam to be able to help you realize, oh, I think we are dealing with JIA and this is probably the type that you need. So therefore you might need the eye doctor right away. You are gonna be going to also your rheumatologist, but then you can help them deal with all their multiple symptoms. And then lastly, we have a lot of treatments so we can approach our, 
and, and manage our patient symptoms. And we need to support them holistically, whether that's medication or multidisciplinary or psychological support, because at the end of the day, that's an individual who with giving them that chronic diagnosis, they start to forget their future or dismiss their future. Our job is to make them feel well enough to still dream and to be who they're going to be. Awesome. Thank you. Well enough to dream. I love that. What an ending. That was incredible. Yeah. Is there anything that you'd like to plug? Anything that we should point our listeners to, to, to check out? Well, you asked lots of questions about personalizing medicine. And um, I'm just happy to say I'm part of a huge uh, international collaboration. And it's the Canadian Netherlands Personalized Medicine Network in Childhood Arthritis and Rheumatic Disease. And they're asking those kind of questions. Can we learn early about the genetics? Can we learn early about what kid will respond to what medication? So hopefully we get something out of that. So it's you can do. So U-C-A-N-D-U. Like it. Hope we can awesome. do, I hope we can do something for these children <laughs> in the future. Yeah. Awesome. Fantastic. I, I think this episode is going to maybe inspire some med students to go to pediatric rheumatology and be yes. one of the next leaders in uh, some genetic-based uh, uh, treatment. We'd love it. We love more people. <laughs> Absolutely. And Thank you. The whole body can't run away from any part. <laughs> they tease us about awesome rheumatologists. They'll look up your nose. They'll look everywhere. <laughs> they're, they're the smartest ones in the room, for sure. ID, I think, a close second. but That's right. We um, look yeah. everywhere. That's right. That's right. <laughs> This has been another episode of The Cribsiders. It's for the kids! Get show notes and sign up for our weekly knowledge food formula feeds newsletter on our website at www.thecribsiders.com. We're committed to providing you with high value practice changing knowledge and to do that we need your feedback. So please subscribe, rate, and review the show on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, any Android podcast, whatever app you have. We really appreciate your ratings. All of them. You can also email us at thecribsiders at gmail.com. A special thanks to our wonderful producer for this episode, Dr. Becca Raymond Colker, and our wonder, wonderful social media team. Tonight, I've been Justin Lee Burke. I've been Becca Raymond Colker. And this has been. Who has it been? <laughs> I started speaking in tongues. And this has been Chris the Chew Man Chew. Thank you, and good night, and good morning, and good afternoon. See y'all. Hey, you've already listened to the entire episode. Now claim CME credit. Continuing education credit is provided by VCU Healthcare Continuing Education. VCU is accredited to provide continuing education to the entire healthcare team. Check it out at cribsiders.vcuhealth.org for more information and to claim your credit after listening to this episode.